Um, hi. Talking to Arnheiður Eiríksdóttir today. Um, she is from Iceland. We, let's call her Atta. It's an easier name to pronounce. Atta is an opera singer. She works in the opera here in Prague in the Czech Republic. <coughs> and um, no, did I say she's Icelandic? Oh, she's Icelandic. And also works in operas in Germany and has worked in, in Vienna, different places. And uh, yeah, we talked about opera, how that works, why does someone go into opera and uh, what background she had and, and experiences. She had studied piano, she had stage fright, so she didn't want to play the piano, but she was comfortable singing on stage. She used to sing in funerals in Iceland, explained to me how that works. Um, and uh, yeah, what brought her into 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 this? And when she toured with Björk, the famous Icelandic singer, as a part of her choir on a project, got to see the whole world. Yeah, and she gave me kind of an insight into the opera world in a way, like you know, Me Too, patriarchy, <laughs> um, body types, uh, body positivity, body negativity, and uh, how you need to you know look after yourself to be able to be an opera singer, how you can sing and what do opera singers and, and screaming babies have in common. Uh, it was a lot of interesting stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, I think kind of, yeah, we covered a lot of different stuff around this and um, um, Ada is going to get married to a, a Czech guy. So she was talking a little bit about the cultural difference between Czech and, and, and Icelandic people, which I found interesting. So, yeah, I hope you enjoy this episode. I really enjoyed talking to Ada. She is fun and very straightforward, let's say, uh, as, as to be expected, though. Uh, the sponsors, guys, that the Old Bar in Prague, Old Bar on Seifertova 21. And there you can get delicious old meals and skier. Skier is an Icelandic yogurt uh, made specially for the old bar, nowhere else available. Amazing toppings, everything is made in-house. You can order online or come there in person and do a takeaway or a quick eat in the place. And then Alfred Jobs, alfred.cz, where you can find your dream job, whether that is in the app, in the App Store, Alfred Jobs app, or alfred.cz on the web, available in English, Slovak. Czech and Ukrainian language you can find your dream job and you can s apply with one click you're anonymous, it's super cool, convenient and easy to use, check that out guys Ata, yeah. how are you? I'm very good Yeah. you're Icelandic right? yes I'm Icelandic and so are you yeah. Oh, wow. Great. <laughs> what a coincidence. Yeah, this this is like a this is like a solar eclipse or something, you know, like two Icelandic people in the same room in a foreign country of 10 million people. It's like a very unlikely event, right? Oh yeah. <coughs> it's it's so funny where wherever you go here, you're always the first Icelandic person they meet. Yeah. I was in a, I, I just started at the chat class this morning and Always, it's it's always they say, oh, you're the first Icelandic person to that I have in my class, and it it makes you feel special. Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 a little bit funny actually. Me and my my girlfriend, she's Hungarian, mm -hmm. and before she met me, she everywhere she went, she said I'm Hungarian. Everybody's like, wow, really, I love Budapest. Now she says, yeah, I'm Hungarian, and he's Icelandic. Ah, Iceland, <laughs> and it's like it's such a horrible thing for her, you know, because. I don't. I think like five minutes afterwards, they don't even remember where she's from because everybody is <laughs> freaking out about Iceland. Yeah, it's it's weird, but uh, we have to be careful not to let it get to our heads. I guess <laughs> uh, it's too late for me. <laughs> but um, your 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 real name is not Atta. It's Arnheiður Eriksdóttir. Yeah, it's a very that's very popular as well. Yeah, <laughs> it's easy to pronounce. Everybody gets it straight away. Yeah. You no, know, usually through through all of my studies in in. Like in Austria, it was always like, okay, so David, Stefan, and then just like a panic, like a silent panic, uh -huh. <laughs> until I said, yeah, I guess you're, I guess you're looking for my name. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, yeah, let's use Atta. I think it's yeah. better for both of us and and the and the audience specifically. But um, so, Atta, what are you? I'm an I'm an opera singer. Mm. I'm now working here in Prague at the National Theatre at the National Opera, and uh, yeah, I'm a 
a mezzo soprano, which is a like a medium high voice. What does? Can you make give me a, like a sound? Just like <laughs> no, a, don't make me do it. Yeah, no, just I just like a little. Just <laughs> like, is that like? <laughs> oh no, I don't know. It's difficult because sitting in a relaxed position like this, you cannot make the same sounds as you do on stage. No. It's a different. It's like a whole flow of energy kind of thing. You need your yeah. whole body because the whole point is that we don't have microphones. So it's all about using... So there are no mics. There are no microphones. So we have to be louder than a symphony orchestra and fill big holes. Wow. So that's the entire sport of it, which is why we study it for so long, because it's really it's really like an athletic activity, and you need to train certain muscles and make sure other muscles are relaxed enough so that you are using the bones in your body uh -huh. to, to resonate. The and sound. You, yeah, to resonate the sound, so you are your own microphone. Wow, that's cool. I didn't know this. No, and which is the whole point. It's really a science, and which is why you get this weird opera sound. And why it's when it's on the radio, it sometimes sounds so weird and actually not so nice because it's not designed to be heard from right next to the mouth. Uh -huh. It's designed to be heard through the filter of the orchestra. Uh -huh. um, and, But how, how does it work then? Like, I don't know, if we... <clears throat> I mean, this is not a big room. This is a, The studio is tiny, but... Would you feel uncomfortable singing in a room like this? Yeah, because I it's small. Mm -hmm. Because you don't you don't feel that it, the room will do what the room should do, like in an opera house. And especially since it's a studio, you have all of these things yeah. on the wall yeah. to, to isolate it, yeah. which is the opposite of we what we need. Uh -huh. Which is why you end up having these beautiful concert halls and stuff where the roof is usually a bit, um, yeah. yeah, where it's really designed so that the room. Is carrying the sound for you instead mm -hmm. of a microphone. It's rounded. The yeah, roof, is, round, rounded, the roof right. is rounded. The roof is rounded. So that you are usually at least on an opera stage. You're standing on the stage and the orchestra is below you in an orchestra pit. Mm -hmm. And the bigger the orchestra, the more it's usually almost under the stage. Like a Wagnerian orchestra is really under the stage. Mm -hmm. So but that that's you can all really for the so acoustics. That you, that's all for the acoustic. Mm -hmm. So that your voice, because you're never, like a human voice is never louder in like decibels than a symphony orchestra. But it's like a science of going through the holes in the in the sound spectrum. That you either use the house to carry your voice mm. by manipulating sound waves through a specific technique, or you go through that you have your like what we call the attacker of the note, that you are slightly ahead of the orchestra so that you can so that the ear hears it a bit sooner and then the ear keeps it so it feels like it hears you as loudly as the orchestra. Mm -hmm. So wow. through this, this is all a thing that you really need to, I mean, I have a bachelor's and a master's. No, I don't have a master's. I left my studies and didn't because I had to write an essay and it was very difficult for an opera singer to write an essay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, it was really like a six year intensive studies. And I also studied, studied in Iceland before that. So to train the certain muscles in the body, because you cannot learn this. Uh -huh. It really is, you need to do one thing after another, training this muscle, up. build it up. Because you're really, yeah, training your body to do something. Mm -hmm. Or rather, retraining your body to do something that we know how to do as babies. Uh -huh. Because kids, when they scream, you you hear it. Uh -huh. That's they use true. That, and you know when they cry, their entire body shakes. Yeah. Because they're using their, their entire li tiny little body to make an incredibly loud noise. Yeah. And basically, the, the operatic studies, when you learn to use your voice in this way, you are learning, you're relearning to do this. And get all of these, because society is always shushing us through the entire school system, especially girls. Mm. You're always being shushed, so you always have to speak quietly, be polite. And this, and, and really, it's now, now always when I hear my, my, my little cousins, when I hear them scream, I'm so happy. That, yeah. they're using, that they're using their whole body, that they're being loud. Because the, the society is always shushing us and actually blocking us, mm. which is why everybody has... Like all of the actresses usually have completely ruined vocal cords because they're using they're not using the the tools that they actually have to be loud, mm -hmm. but they're using their their polite, nice voice, but just louder. Mm -hmm. And that is really difficult for our vocal cords, actually. It's interesting because actually now when you <clears throat> when you say this, I mean, um, I I. I I think yeah we are we are not using the vocal cords as much as we did I mean and I I feel a difference on myself just in the last I don't know maybe 15 years or something because now it's emails it's chats it's less phone calls mm -hmm. so when I go out now which doesn't happen enough 
no to my girlfriend doesn't happen enough. <laughs> um, then, and we speak and we're sp- meeting people and we're talking to them. I'm tired in the voice. Mm-hmm. And my voice is rusty the day after, you know? And not rusty like nice Rolf Stewart rusty, but like a bad rusty and I feel bad. Yeah, well, that's because, I mean, it's just like when you... When you're always when you run two three times a week, mm. and then you don't do it for two months, mm. you're gonna be you're gonna have sore muscles the day after running when you got get back to it. Yeah, you yeah. cannot run as much as you used to when you were in training. Mm. Oh, so it's just it's all it's all it's all muscles. It's all the same. So the we same should principle. be less silent. Yes, or yes. more silent. It depends on or sc- or scre- <laughs> what scream more. your end goal. No, but because I know you are really into like metal and and yeah. stuff like this. I mean the way like growling and stuff like this that's also incredible training that that takes mm. and i actually know a lot of operatic tenors that's a high voice the high male voice that came from that world mm-hmm. that became interested in opera singing because through the thought of mastering the voice but mastering not being not completely screaming your voice out because this is probably if you do if you growl wrong mm. you you can do it what for 5 minutes and yeah. then you then you cannot speak for a week yeah but if you're if somebody has the voice to to do that for an entire night, that's a pretty impressive yeah. voice and a pretty impressive like knowledge or like Feature, or, yeah. Or, yeah, either knowledge of the muscles you use or just being naturally gifted at it. Mm. But um, r- right now, because we've been trying to meet up now for a while, and you've been kind of in and out of Prague. You live here in Prague, right? I live here in Prague. And. Uh, and you're going to perform, you're starting some performance here, right? You've been training for something, and wh- what is that? Yeah, well, here, it's a different, you have, like, opera houses usually have two options of a system. They either have, they have rehearsals and then many shows of the same, because you always need, before you do a show, it takes a lot of preparation. So you need, like, a minimum of six weeks for a new production to rehearse it and be able to do it nicely on stage. Mm. And then you have some, like the like, the Italian houses usually... You rehearse the six weeks and then you do a block of seven or eight or however many shows you want to do. But here in Prague, you rehearse for a while and then you do one show in November, two in December, three in January. Mm-hmm. And you just you just keep going back to the same show over and over again. And you rehearse in between, I guess. Yes, but like short refreshing rehearsals. Mm-hmm. So actually now what I will be singing next week is the, the Barber of Seville, where I'm singing the, the female lead. There, That we actually rehearsed in November. And I've been doing like one or two shows a month through the entire year. Of that one? Of that one. Uh-huh. And alternating between a few different shows I'm in. So in one week I can have up to four different different performances. So you can can you sing like a lead role in an opera four times a week? I mean, is is that vocally possible or or? Yeah, if you're if you're in like if you're in a good shape, then yeah, it's definitely doable. Uh-huh. Which is the whole point of the technique that ideally. Like after I sing that role, that in the like it's the role is called Rosina. After I sing that, usually I feel completely fresh in my voice after it, and I'm ready for a rehearsal the morning after. Uh huh. So, so yeah. So you're telling me your job is easy? No, not at all. <laughs> because as soon as you have even the slightest hint of a cold, then it's be- it becomes a whole different game. Yeah. Uh-huh. And also you just you just let out such an enorm- enormous because you're I I hardly ever get tired in my voice anymore. Mm. But you're giving a lot of energy. I mean, you're standing there for three, three and a half hours on stage. I mean, these are long pieces. (laughs) That's really long. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So you're giving your entire energy. You're using everything at your disposal to keep the audience of around Mm -hmm. a thousand entertained. And then you come out after it and you just completely used up all of your energy preserves. And then you hit the bar. And then you hit the bar, which is why usually like three, four shows a week is at least my, my maximum. And... I now recently did six, and the last one was not. It was not my level anymore because mm. I was just. I felt it was not that my voice was tired. That was all fine, but I just felt I was. I kept zoning out <laughs> because I was just so mentally drained. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. And you and you're you're also. <coughs> you told me also you're busy. You're planning your wedding, right? Yes, we're doing that. You you're getting married to a Czech guy. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we're trying to plan a wedding. It's a lot of. Because we, we got engaged actually two years ago, but we decided we wanted my family to come from Iceland mm. and and his family, they, he's 
even though he's Czech, he's actually Moravian, like yeah. you say here, that it's a, <laughs> it's a big deal to the Czech people, but you're, you're not just Czech, you're really like Balakian. He's from yeah. the mountains in, in close to the Slovak border, so getting his family here is also a big organization. Yeah, it's like too. six hours or something. Yeah, it's yeah. really, it's surprisingly far. Yeah. No, it's more like if you drive, it's like four or five hours, uh-huh. I think. Yeah. And will you sing at the wedding? No. I is he, he's a singer as he's well. He's a singer as well. And, and what is he, oh, like a... No. B- so, so he's I mean, like no, he's a bass baritone. Uh huh. It's called. It's like the. It's also the medium male okay. voice. Uh huh. It's, it's very stereotypical because you have these stereotypes of the singers, and I love. There's this one picture of like what are they thinking? And the what is it? The soprano is thinking about the applause. The tenor is thinking about how amazing his voice is sounding. The bass is thinking about fixing a uh, fishing. And the master soprano is thinking about the baritone, <laughs> <laughs> so it's always, <laughs> yeah. And um, like that. so no, but we decided we we do not want to sing at our own. Wedding. And that wouldn't be know. an expectation. I mean, two singers no. having a wedding. I mean, some people do it. It's just not not our style. We're not the kind of people who are always always singing everywhere. And we have a lot of friends that are artists that are always doing that. And I really really like it. And I actually might be quite jealous of them. Mm. But I'm always I've always been quite quite shy to randomly start singing or to put myself forward, which is very not practical in my line of business. But, yeah, so I feel like that's... I, it would stress me and it would distract me from enjoying, enjoying the time with yeah. my family, actually. Yeah. And will it be like a big wedding, like outdoor outdoor yeah. thing and hundreds of people and... Mm, not hundreds of people, but it's always it's always so many yeah. so many people you feel like you have to invite and then you want to invite others and... And but of course it's bigger. a but of course it's a big filter to have them come here because we're doing it in Czech Republic in the Czech Republic, so it's gonna be it's you're expecting many people from from Iceland not to come, mm. but but still I'm look very much looking forward to having everybody here yeah. at the same time it's gonna be so surreal. And how how is it now? Just out of curiosity, because um, uh, we got we got this war in Ukraine, and 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 I read actually I just wanted to ask you that I read somewhere with the. Um, that they they they've been banning some performances of Russian music and and you know I don't know some Russian work from Russian composers. Yeah. Is there some something like that in the opera? Has it somehow a affected l- the opera? A lot of it. I mean, the biggest names. I mean, they're really they're opera superstars mm-hmm. there. And there's this conductor called Georgiev, who is really has been openly an ally of Putin and is really. But he's one of the biggest names in classical music today. And he was cancelled. He really was... He had some amazing positions. He was really the head conductor of big orchestras and big houses. And and he had everything cancelled. Mm-hmm. Which I think is correct because he really refused to take a stand mm-hmm. and to be such a public figure. It's In his case, I think it was okay, but I've seen so many, so many young singers being cancelled because they didn't want to publicly take a stance. Mm-hmm. But I think we here think it's so easy to take a stance, but you don't realise... When your family is back in Russia and you are losing your job because you don't post on I mean it's it's really it's it's more of course you I mean everyone I talk to is against it. Every single Russian artist I have talked to is completely against it. Mm. But not of all of them. They're they're scared for their families. I mean, mm. it's difficult. So I think it's a double edged blade, but of course we need to do everything we can to 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 fight this war and fight this war to stop this war, mm. but to make the Russian public really suffer, it's, in my opinion, very, it's difficult. It's not so, it's not, it's, it's not, not black and white. And white. I agree. <laughs> I, I, and it's interesting that you, you mentioned this because, yeah, I had seen something out of the classical music world about, about this cancelling of, mm-hmm. of people and, and, and demanding of people to, to kind of pledge against the government. And um, mm-hmm. I had a girl here on my, on an episode here recently, um, a, a, a Russian stand-up comedian that that lives in in Barcelona, and uh, she she told me that that fir- like you said, first of all, the family has now kind of disowned her because she doesn't agree with them, and they 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 agree with Putin's policies and and the invasion. And secondly, she said, I'm not even I'm not sure I will be let into the country after what I have posted publicly and. And I don't think it's fair to, in that sense, to take a regular 
Joe or, or Joanne and tell them, listen, uh, we want you to put out a statement that might mean that you can never go to your home country and never see your parents again. Or even worse, it might mean something awful happens to your family as punishment yeah. for that. And, uh, That's, I think, what many of them are afraid of. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, when you look at it from the point of view of the Ukrainians and the Ukrainians I have around me, because, I mean, there are a lot just here. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of Ukrainians everywhere, in the opera, everywhere. But when you talk to them, of course, they are thinking, yeah, I did, like, what, do I deserve to be punished? That my family is, so I think the anger towards the Russians are really, they are justifying it by the fact that they are also not asking for the family to be in trouble and Russia is doing it to them. Mm-hmm. So the Russian people also need to feel that pain to to find the strength to rise up against it. Yeah, but it's just so but often. I d- but I don't agree with it. But I just, I just needed to be, to play devil's advocate a bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I can see that point of view, and I can understand the argument being made that way. But I think, mm-hmm. like, in the end, like a, a normal person who doesn't have any military affiliation or political affiliation, uh, and isn't necessarily like an influential person in the society, it's, it's just not like it's not there. They don't have any decision-making power, and they are the ones that lose the most also because, you know, all these sanctions, for example, and all the stuff we're doing, the ones that suffer are the people who need to go to the supermarket and need to fill the gas on their car and and just want to get on with life, you know, regular Joes, you know, and Joannes. And and it's it's... They are the ones that, because the oligarchs, they're already, they put their money somewhere hiding and the politicians as well. They they don't need to worry about this. It's not going to bite them in the end, you know. Like someone like this Abramovich, he doesn't care if he owns a billion or two billion. It doesn't make any difference for him. It's the same money, you know. No, but the regular people are really fighting to eat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting thing, and I yeah I, I but ha- has that happened here in Prague that that Russian artists have n- or or work by Russian artists or Russian artists have been kind of excluded from I've performance? Not, I've not seen it so much here in Prague. I think for I I don't know if this is a secret, but I heard like some rumors about one Russian piece being taken off the the schedule for next season. Okay. But I think that was not just because it was Russian. It was really about. Uh-huh. Do it for Mother Russia. It was really like the propaganda uh-huh. piece that was would have been wildly inappropriate. Uh-huh. But I this is just some rumors I heard. Yeah, yeah. But I was, for example, now in Cologne, Germany. I was singing there. They had an amazing piece, a Russian piece, which was really actually, it was based on a novel which was written in the time of Stalin, the the Master and Marguerite, I think it's called. And they that was really interesting because it was actually really. Talking, it was a political, how do you say, like a satire, mm-hmm. judging the Russian society mm-hmm. and the difference between the the common people and the rich. The the rich who are actually in this piece, they were really portrayed as barely human, mm-hmm. like as these literal monsters in this staging, which I think is very like it's good that they didn't take it just because it was by a Russian Russian author, yeah. the original book, yeah. because it is exactly. I mean, the strongest strongest judgment of it comes from the Russian people. Yeah, and I think I I think also like uh, I mean that's a yeah maybe I didn't want to go too much into the topic, but I think that by kind of canceling both what goes into Russia and what comes out of Russia is is it I think that pushes people a little bit more together. We are both Icelandic. Um, I don't know how much you recall. Yeah, you do recall a lot from the from the financial crisis when we had the collapse of the Icelandic banks. Even if we knew we had done something wrong, the way that foreign countries treated us made us stand together. We hated England because they put us on the a terrorist list for money laundering or whatever. You know, we didn't like Norway because they didn't want to give us a loan. You know, like so. I, I th- and I think this is the risk. I think when you actually kind of tell people. Anything from your country is not on the menu. Uh, we don't want to let you have access to anything. We wanna. We don't want to hear from you, even if you're just a uh, normal Vladimir. And then, I think we're actually maybe risking more to push people together and and unifying behind Russia somehow. You know, in, instead of using the chance to kind of divide them and say, "Listen, guys, here in Germany, everything is great. You know, be like us." Wow, I never thought about it like that. Yeah, but I, but it completely makes sense. Mm. I mean, you create a common enemy. Yeah, exactly. That's the best way to get people to stand together. Yeah. 
Wow, we've gone deep into politics. We went deep, we went deep. <laughs> accidentally. Politics with no, a mess of soap. Yeah, exactly. Talking, talking politics. Mm. No, but I, but it, I mean, in the end, always comes down to should you expect artists mm. to take a political stance or are they supposed to be exactly the distraction? Mm. Are, you, are you supposed to use art? I mean, there are just two really, these are the two options. Are you supposed to use art to move the politics, to... to to help the people see the way that you believe is correct or whatever? Or is this supposed to be the neutral territory where you're allowed to say everything, where you're allowed to do everything? Mm. And just completely, have fun. Completely irrelevant yeah. to, to who is in charge or... yeah. Mm. And have fun. Yeah. Um... But how how did how did this whole thing happen? How did how did a, a girl from Iceland end up being a opera singer in Europe? I mean, is the, is there opera in the family or, or? Well, there's not opera in the family, but there are a lot of musicians in the family. Mm. I really, it's it was always there was always music. My dad uh, is a trumpet player in the Icelandic Symphony Orchestra, and just in general, uh, so there's just a sh- deep love of music. It's really, it's so amazing. Always, I'm always mind blown at his love of music mm. and in my home growing up growing up there was never silence there was always music in the background or so i have such so such a huge like arsenal of different different songs i know so many songs but it was just always playing it was always there was always music and what type of music was it cl- classical or anything everything, or everything mm. everything he i mean he has a degree in both in classical music and and jazz music, so there was jazz music there. But he was really into like prog and and mm-hmm. like focus and really like Genesis and just like all everything. And as kids, we were listening to all of these things, and he was telling us stories with all of the everything ranging from some Bach cantata to to yeah, well not metal, but yeah, <laughs> but really, which is so wonderful. Which means I always grew up needing music and but it it was really like one thing one thing came after the other it was always the logical next step for me and mm-hmm. it was never i was never the teenager who was now i'm gonna be an opera star it was never anything like that it was always just the lot yeah the next logical step for me and and but you 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 sang in a choir and you were studying piano mm-hmm. yeah well i just like most kids started studying piano yeah, just but most don't, kids don't, don't study piano, Not, right? Yes, I, many kids just like just like they start study the flute or just to get get to know some instrument. I think uh-huh. it's very many kids do, but I just I just really liked it, so I con- kept doing it. And it, all through all through my stu- normal studies that you kind of have to do oh. in Iceland. I mean, until you're eighteen, nine, what nineteen now? Mm. When you finish what's called mm. I guess that's hi- high, school? high school. Yeah, high it's school, something yeah. some hybrid between high school and university, I guess. Uh. Until then, I was always doing both. I was always playing the piano and studying, but playing the piano is hard. Yeah, you need the like. If I thought if the singing discipline, if you think it takes a lot of discipline to sing, oh my, it is. It is. You need really when you want to be a concert pianist. We're talking six, seven hours a day practicing. Really, like five. Yeah, at least where I was, I was trying. I mean, I was doing full studies at the at the at the high school, trying to have a social life like a normal teenager, but trying to fit in. Four hour, four or five hours every day. It was, it was not, it was not doable for me. I didn't burn for it enough. But that was mainly also because I didn't have the fire to perform because I was so nervous always on stage when I was playing the piano. Mm. I really, it was. I just started shaking uncontrollably, and even I didn't need to be on stage in front of people. It was really even if my friends were standing behind me and wanted me to play some song for them, my hands were shaking and I really couldn't find the notes. I couldn't. It was really, it was very strange, but I enjoyed making music by myself in a room, and mm-hmm. I enjoyed the that work. But but, but how like because you say like um, I mean <clears throat> yeah of course I'm I'm older than you, and, and that much older that I think in the meantime since my school years and and yours it I think the music kind of came into the schools it became part of the school system. You could study music at the same school as you were studying your regular studies, right? That actually, no, that came after. That came I after. I think like two years uh-huh. after I graduated, it became. But I managed to get like some of my music studies evaluated into it, but not so much. I uh-huh. actually just went through the school like everybody else, and I just did both of it. And I would 
be out. That's I the would thing. leave I would leave the house at eight in the morning and I would come at like nine in the evening because I was then practicing when everything was over. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Like it mm -hmm. was such a I never remember those f very few kids that I knew that studied instruments. Um it was it was a lot of extra work, you know. It wasn't like a, a seamless part of the, 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 the their daily program. It was like an extra effort. And also, you know, I don't know. I mean, like I had this guy on my street who studied the violin and it, I, I, I can't say that that was to his advantage when it came to wh whom to bully <laughs> on the street, you know. Like, wasn't that like a... Because you're saying, you know, I'm a regular teenager. I want to be a regular teenager. But do regular teenagers play piano? Well, in the school, I yeah, many. Where were many, you in school? I was in Emhau. I was in Emhau. Oh, okay, that's the all the arti artists arti go. Yeah, uh, so it was a very so school. I was surrounded by a group that was doing it, but it was more that everybody was going out all the time, and I just couldn't. Everybody was meeting at somebody's place after school, and I had to go to the music school instead of meeting with them. Mm. But but it always helped. I mean, I was like you said, I was in the in the choir mm. there, and there I had really a, a circle of friends that were also doing the same. That we're also doing everything at the same time, and and we took turns meeting, crying just because of because we were just so tired. We were just doing everything and and still trying to fit in. And mm. it was sometimes it was difficult, but I would not change it for for anything. I'm because so, you I'm have so this glad I did both. It was really I'm so glad. Yeah. Because I meet I mean my my boyfriend here, my fiance, <laughs> <laughs> is uh, he went to a music music high school, mm. and I think it is a bit. Difficult for him. like he just he just stopped learning math when he was like fifteen or something. You know, mm -hmm. that's it's, crazy. That's crazy, yeah. Because you really you emphasize different things. But he was having more music theory and stuff, and I mean a normal, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's it's interesting. I mean, you always have to choose. I mean, I I personally believe in not taking the choice away from you too early, mm -hmm. even though it is demanding to do so much. I think the way, the Central European way of telling you when you're 10 years old, you cannot, because you're not so good in math, you can never go this, you like put you already in a lane mm. when you're so young. That's too young. That's too young, but they do it here, I think. Mm -hmm. Really, when you're nine, you decide if you're going to go in the direction of working with your hands or if you're going to go in the direction of science. That's very That's early. That's very early. I mean, I didn't even know what I wanted to be when I was 20, you know? Yeah. No, same. Same. And you kind of take, but I think I think also that's a bit of an Icelandic thing in a way that, and what you're saying is that I, <clears throat> I, I went to law school in the end, University of Iceland, and and then I, when I graduated as a lawyer, I never worked as a lawyer, but then I started using the services of other lawyers because I had a lot of businesses and I, I needed lawyers. And what I found out in 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 Iceland is that we are we are extremely generalist, like in a way that. As you're saying, so you're probably the best math educated opera singer in Prague. You know, like no one else has done as much math. And I have this feeling, and it was the same when I started meeting lawyers. I started asking, I moved to Denmark and I started talking to lawyers about something. Oh, can you help me? No, uh, my friend here is a specialist in that. And everyone was a specialist. And I said, what the fuck? In Iceland, every lawyer knows everything about everything because it's such a small market. And I have a feeling that we kind of, we want to keep a lot of options open yeah. until very late. Oh, yeah. But I, I also, especially as an artist, I think you need to have a plan B. You cannot live from your art in Iceland. It's very, mm. very few people who do. Uh, especially in the singing, you really have to you have to do everything. I mean, you don't have an opera company really like you do here. Mm. You can't. There is no position in Iceland where you have a steady paycheck every month like I have here. Mm. There's, there's just nothing. You can teach, yes, you can do that. But at, as a per singing performer, you really have to make your opportunities completely. But there it's is that. You. you did funerals. Yeah, but I would not have been able. I mean, that was like as a side thing with my studies. If I would have, I was, I was living, living still at my parents' place. But if I would have had to pay rent, mm. that wouldn't have been enough to live from. No? No, I think you need to always do everything. Mm. You need to be a part of really, when you're a part of the scene... You need to do a little bit of everything. You to you need to teach. You need to sing in funerals. You need to just. Let's. Um, how is how is it when you when you sing in funerals? I mean, how how does that work? I mean, 
How do you promote yourself? Do you go to the hospital and find out who's about to die and then you talk to the <laughs> relatives? or? No, it's usually through you. Con- they contact the choir, they request a certain choir or mm. a certain organist that takes with him the choir or they request a certain soloist. I, I'm not actually sure mm. when, how you do it when you're a soloist, but I at least was just a part of a choir or like a small singing group that was then called through th- through an organist. But to do it, it was really, it's weird when, you, when you're when you a part of such a, it's somebody's really, for some people, it's their worst day. Mm. And you're there just uh, at your, in your lunch break, getting out of German class or whatever, <laughs> going there. Mm. And But and it pays. It's, it, it's it pays, a paid it's gig. Nice. Yes, yes. Mm. And it, like good, it's, it pays well. But how it's beautiful, but it's really a beautiful thing when you manage to make somebody's moment. Mm. Like when you make, because it's so important to, that the funeral is nice. Mm. It's so important. But do you need to get yourself into like a, I mean, I don't know, is there like a protocol? You need to be careful that you're not smiling or you're not laughing. Or you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Because you you don't want to, you know, you need to act appropriately somehow, right? Oh, definitely. You need to just have respect for the situation. You need to really be super professional. Mm. You need to be actually quite cold because it's not about you. You are, you are more, it's more, you're more of a background music. It's not a concert. Mm-hmm. You're not actually performing in that way. You're making the most beautiful music you can, but you're not having this whole like smiling show business. Yeah, you don't want to put on situation. your best. You don't really want to shine or stand no, out, right? No, you wanna. You want this to be really. You want the music that you perform. You want that to remind people of the person, of the yeah. main event, even of the person who is being buried, whose funeral it is. Mm-hmm. You want to give the give the energy to them. And 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 how how many funerals do you think you've been at? I have no idea. Because mo- a lot of people have never been to a funeral. A lot of people your age, because you're young, yeah, they never had a grandma or grandfather that died. You know, like uh, and 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 here in from f- from what I've heard here, I mean, I haven't done like a scientific study or anything, but in this region here, it's actually quite uncommon that a kid goes to a funeral. Really? I went to funerals when I was like nine, you know. Yeah, but I guess it's a luck thing, right? I mean, I I think I like me personally. Mm. I have not attended very many. No, luckily. Yeah, from from attended, your own. Yeah, from yeah. my own, like where I've been in the front row crying. You know, it's yeah. not. I've not. Luckily, I've not had comes that, that many that many experiences with that. It's one of the things that comes with age. Yeah, it's more and more. It's mm. it's starting now for me. It's always yeah, but but I mean, you really. But what you need to do, you need to protect yourself. When I started, it's you need you cannot go with them because you also cannot be crying. You cannot perform if you're crying mm. with them. Mm. Because I'm a very empathetical person. I really I cry very easily. Just when I feel the emotional flow from somebody, I I'm the awful person that starts crying with them, you know? So I really needed to to have a wall mm-hmm. between me and mm-hmm. and the and the whole situation there. And, and you don't go and get the coffee and the cakes afterwards. No, no, no. no. So that's not Correct. how the fat opera singer is is created. No, definitely not. No, no. Um, it's not. No, you're not. You're not invited. No. To go there. No, it's not. It's not a. That's the thing about Icelandic funerals is that after uh, after person is buried, we actually meet up somewhere. Usually, I don't. know, It could be like a rented space from the church or something, and we have pancakes and cakes mm. and and it's actually often a pl- it's often a pleasant thing somehow. People are catching up with relatives that they haven't seen for a long time. It's not such a depressive thing, and the and the catering is great. Yes, it's beautiful. Oh, I love the I love the sugar pancakes. Yeah, uh, that my my friend always calls us that calls them sugar penises. I had yeah. never heard that before. Do, yeah. do you know that? No. It's so funny. But I can't get, get, get the it connection. It makes sense, yeah. but it's so funny when he was. Like, so how are you going to have sugar penises there? And I was like, what? <laughs> going to have what? What? <laughs> but how how so? You say you cry easily and you mm-hmm. you empathize. I guess that's a quality when it comes to opera because being an opera singer, you're kind of a, you're a performer but, or like a singer, mm-hmm. but you're also an actress yeah. because yeah. you you need to kind of act out the whole role, right? Yeah, and you need to feel the. It always helps you if you feel the logic and the flow of the music, and if you feel what your character is feeling in that scene, mm-hmm. that of course makes it more easy to act, and it makes it more easy to sing, and it makes the music make sense. Mm-hmm. And I mean, as opera singers, you're really you're doing everything. 
you really you're juggling all of these balls in the you have all of these balls in the air that you need to act you need to act convincingly you need to move convincingly on stage you need to sing and make nice music you need to be with the orchestra mm. because you cannot always hear them so well mm-hmm. when you're on, on the back of the stage you really because you don't have any click track or anything you don't have like any click pop. track you have uh-huh. a you have a conductor who is there in front of you ideally he's in the fr- in front of you but you still need to you're singing to the person standing to your right but still with one corner of your eye you need to be with the conductor who is mm-hmm. who is really so you need to very be- elegantly not look at the person you're talking to but look at that guy over there <laughs> who is making sure you're with the orchestra there's there no whisperer there is no one like i like when you see in the movies then there's someone in the like there's this box out of the stage and someone is down there at the, Reminds you of mm-hmm. your sentence. Do you yeah. have that? Yeah, we have that. Uh-huh. So if you're if you get lost, you can like smoothly move a bit to the right on the stage. At least here they have it on the stage right or stage left, like in mm-hmm. the in the wings. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. So yeah, it's in the wings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's not that box. They don't use the box in the middle anymore. Mm-hmm. I think they have. No, I'm not sure. I never understood the concept of the box in the middle because I would think that's where the orchestra is. Yeah. I don't but know. I'm uh. confused with it. No, but you. Maybe it's just someone really tall from the orchestra that yeah. needs reach. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's gr- like when you need to use it, it's so it's great to have them, especially in rehearsals. You need them a lot, much more than you do in performances. Mm. But it's funny when you listen to opera recordings, you can usually hear like somebody whispering the first line of the of the aria. Mm-hmm. It's funny. And there's like, for example, like Nessun Dorma, Nessun Dorma, and it's like really, yeah. Wow. If you listen for it, it's very often that the, that you can hear the whisperer first say the text, and then and then it comes. But I worked with some colleagues who were using it shamelessly, who were really completely lost and just like catching every word from <laughs> from the whisper. From the whisper, but not so much. It's I don't I don't personally I don't know how to use it. I'm not I don't have that brain capability. I'm not yeah because you really need you to be you multitasking. Put too much, yeah, you put too much effort into the maths. Yeah, exactly. You, you don't have space for this anymore. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Oh, uh, but um, so you said okay, so. Mm-hmm. You're a kid. Yeah. Your da- dad is a trumpet player, and and he introduces you to jazz and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But I mean, uh, how like when did you know that? I mean, I guess you know, like you you like pop music as well. I mean, you like I guess every type of music more or less. Yeah. But how did how did you know that it was gonna be classic or opera or something? I mean, was there? A, did you have like a Mozart? Poster in your room, and then just like, yeah, that's it. No, it oh, Verdi, isn't it Verdi? Yeah, Verdi. No, no, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Richard Strauss kind of girl. Uh-huh. That's my, uh, he's okay, my favorite. Okay, so that was a Strauss. Strauss thing. I like it. No, but that came later. It's yeah. But no, it was one. It was once again that one thing leads to another. I was in that choir, oh. and in the choir, all I was there just minding my own business, just singing there, playing my piano, and all the other girls in the choir. We're doing, going to singing lessons. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, oh, like 14-year-old me was thinking, oh my God, I need to know it. Like 16-year-old was thinking, oh, if they're all doing it, I guess I have to do it as well. And so I started, so I tried it, but I didn't even know what a singing lesson would look like. I mean, you cannot practice it like piano that much anyway. And don't you just kind of sing? I always thought. But I really loved it I, I when I started the singing lessons. And it's a lot of, and I really loved feeling how my voice got better and stronger and how I dared to do more and my breath got longer and, mm-hmm. and things like this. And and then we had in the music school, we had like a small opera performance of an Icelandic story called Gelitrut. And I was singing the role of this troll Gelitrut. Mm. And just the feeling when I walked on the stage and the premiere and I just felt oh, all, eyes, all eyes are on me and it's not bad. Like because when I when I had that feeling when I was playing the piano, it was the scariest and the worst thing in the world. Mm-hmm. But there, it was the best feeling. I just felt like I could play with the attention and play with the emotions of the audience. And of course, I was not, I didn't have the capil- capabilities to do that. But it was just such a nice nice feeling to present something that I felt so comfortable in, in front of the people and and enjoy making the music and enjoy acting. It was such a such a great great feeling that i just felt wow okay i never want to do anything else but that's interesting because i mean th- at this point you've been studying piano for for years and then yeah okay you've been singing in the choir but mm-hmm. but this i guess is your first solo performance as a singer 
yeah. like where or where you have a role mm -hmm. as uh, other than being in the in the choir. Yeah. So why the fuck, you know, like after all these years on the piano, you should be super s feeling super confident, super safe about you know your shit there, you know, and mm -hmm. then. What, what what do you think makes a difference? I think it's the fact that the way we rehearse the opera is a much more of a social thing. That you're basically through every rehearsal, you have all of the other colleagues there. You have the stage director, you have the conductor, you have all of these people. So you kind of, with every rehearsal, you're kind of performing a little. You're in the rehearsal the layers well. of fear yeah, away. Mm -hmm. Because you always have somebody witnessing your practicing and so you're... You don't have this thing that it's just you and your music, and then all of a sudden all of the people are watching something that used to be just your private thing practicing alone in the practice room. Mm -hmm. So I guess that has a lot to do with it, and also that you have more of a more of a like structure that you are fit into because you have the certain ways you're supposed to go on the stage, and you have the other people around you, the 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 orchestra accompanying you. You're not so alone. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. also, when you're singing and you mess up, you can kind of always get back on track. Mm -hmm. Even though you mess up one phrase, you're not lost. But when you're playing a complete, compl uh, complicated piano piece, when you get lost, you sometimes really just, like, your ma mind just goes blank. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult. At least it was always for me mm -hmm. to get back into it. That's interesting. Mm. And and uh, <coughs> so from that moment, when you when you play that uh, troll, Icelandic mm -hmm. troll woman, Gilletrut, uh <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's uh, that's the that's the moment. That's the kind of then you know this is it. This is what I want to do. Well, I didn't know this is what I what I wanted to do with my life. Actually, mm. I maybe over dramatized that one. But <laughs> but no, because it was it was not until a couple of years later that I decided. Okay, I will give it a try to only do this, and then I applied for the studies in Vienna, mm -hmm. not expecting to get in at all, but. Mm. But just thought it's, I mean, in Vienna, it's really the center of classical music. It's going to Vienna as a singer is like moving to L.A. as an actor. Mm -hmm. It's you have so many opportunities there. All the best singers go through there. Why is that? Why, 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 what is it? Why? I mean, why is this region? Why is it, you know, Prague, Vienna, Munich or like all this? This is like a Bermuda Triangle of music somehow here, mm. right? Yeah, I think it has to do with the, that you just put so much, put so much value on 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 classical music here, I mean it's really a part of the a part of the history and a part of the nation. And I mean in Vienna especially, it's a big part of the tourism as well, mm -hmm. which always helps. Mm -hmm. And you have these three great opera houses in in Vienna that are that attract a lot of audience that comes mm. for it. So I think that the Austrians really take it as one of their national national identities. Yeah. So, but, yeah, but it is still like that. And here in, Czech, in the Czech Republic, you have an opera house in every single little, mm. like if there's a village with, you know, if there's a town with more than 5,000 people, you have an opera house, almost. Mm. And the same in Germany. And 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 these, I mean, do you, do you have a feeling that these, uh, the popularity of this, or, or let's say that, yeah, that, that it's, it's kind of it's maintaining its position. It's not losing its position, like in Vienna, for example. I mean, it's it's just. I think in Vienna, it's ma maintaining its position through it being such a national pride. Mm -hmm. But in Germany, they're really struggling because they are fighting to keep the audience, and in my opinion, using kind of the wrong tools. Mm -hmm. They're trying to make the opera more like the the German theater which means a lot of nakedness, a lot of random sex on the stage, a lot of trying to shock and changing the stories. Because Germans they think are so weird. <laughs> so in one weird, end, they're so, so fucking square, and then on the other, they just want to fuck everywhere. It's just, it's just crazy people. More, no, you just want the shock effect all the, all the time. That's the, that's yeah, the, the modern... They call Germans. it the regie, regie theater, is what they call it. And I don't know. I never... I mean... Oh, shit, I'm going to piss off someone now. I mean, it's not like... I don't know, Germans are not like the f light of the party or something. You know what I mean? Like in general, you know, like they're often quiet. And I remember when I lived in Germany for a while, like part time, it was like rules on the walls of how to behave in the house and like everything is fucking Ordnung. And then, oh, let's just have a swingers party with 2,000 people on stage. It's a crazy nation, it's, right? Yeah, it's they're so schizophrenic. Mm. 
no, it's like it's the Japanese. They're, but they're hiding so many things. I feel like getting to know. I mean, I've gotten to my know my share of German people, mm. but it's you. I mean, there won't you. It's, you really need to get to know them for them to let you in. They have this wall. Mm-hmm. For me, very very many of them. Of course, there are exceptions, but they have to. Yeah, they push down a lot of feelings. But I they think. say that about the Czechs also. I mean, that that Czechs have a, that it's hard to get create real friendship with Czech people. I don't know what really? you I, I've not had that experience. No? I have no. I've gotten to know very. I feel like they're much more similar to the Icelandic. Mm-hmm. That of course, I mean, but they say that as well about the Icelandics. But I feel like they're. They're weird in the same way as the Icelandic people. Mm-hmm. It takes you a while. Like, they're not overly friendly on the first impression. But then when they let you in, they let you in. Mm-hmm. Not like they let you in through this... Let you in to this nice character. But mm-hmm. then you find the wall Keep later the than you way, expect. Yeah. 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 No, it's a, it's an interesting... I, I remember oh. when I when I moved to Denmark, like, um, that uh, I was welcome everywhere. But I didn't feel necessarily it was real. It was more like, yeah, this guy is alone here. Let's make sure that he doesn't die of boredom somewhere by himself and we feel guilty, you know? Yeah, that's true. But here, it was different. Here, no one really <laughs> offered me to come anywhere, you know, to barely said hello. But but once you broke that ice and you got through, then, yeah, then you have real friends, actually. But then you also know they really want to be with you if they're yeah. with you. Yeah, they're, yeah. Not, they're not just doing it because they're polite. No, that's true. Mm. What were we talking about? Yeah, this region. So, yeah. so... But how is this? So, so and you said that earlier. Like you couldn't really have like a, have like a paid full time gig um, in Iceland. No, which is why I'm. I don't know. I of course I would love to work in Iceland. I would mm. love to work more in Iceland. But I also really I'm I'm the kind of person that really loves stability. Mm-hmm. Even though I'm doing this job that requires you to travel a lot and stuff, but just to have a basic. I I don't I don't know if I could be a freelancer. It's it takes so much work mm. in different ways. I would rather keep my head head down and do the work somewhere where I know I have mm-hmm. where, where I can just do the work where I don't have to do the do the whole Instagram social media selling myself situation. Oh, I in noticed that that you <laughs> you're not a big you're not a big no. fan of that. No, it's awful. Uh, I need to, yeah. uh, and but <laughs> but um, how's the money in this? I mean, like. Um, is is it possible to make good money in this? And how is the job security? I mean, how does it work? Do you have like a two years contract with an opera house, and then you perform there, or? Yeah, here I have a three year contract at least. Mm-hmm. But in Germany, you usually have always one year, mm-hmm. one year, and then they prolong you or not. And you is find it, out and until you've had it for fifteen years in a row, then you ha- you're then you're there for life. Uh-huh. If one house prolongs you fifteen years in a row, then you have a position for life. Uh-huh. And how? But how is it like? Um, is it is it then like a monthly salary that you get, or are you somehow linked to the performances, or you know, do you know what I mean? Is it just a, like a flat salary, or is there a bonus, or how does it this? De- depends on where you are. In Germany, it's mostly a flat salary. Uh huh. But here, you have a flat salary, and then uh, what you call a role of Nick. You get for each performance a certain amount, depending on the size of your role. Uh huh. But then you also, you freelance on the site. Almost everybody does that. Uh-huh. Which means I am now traveling a lot between Germany and and here. So that between my shows here, I'm doing projects in in, in Cologne still, mm-hmm. where I used to be. in yeah. Matos. So I did a great production of a Czech opera, which was quite funny, to come from here and go to Germany to sing in Czech. <laughs> An Icelandic person. <laughs> yeah, ran, very random. And now I will be going back there for a... For a production of Carmen, which is a really like a really, but that's again like the the German shock effect. Uh-huh. We're talking Carmen as the Virgin Mary sitting on an altar with six boobs and everybody in the church coming and getting milk like fake milk sprayed all over their faces. But is this? I mean, th- th- <laughs> this is not the original script, right? Not at all. But I mean, like, can no. you can you just change something like this as you want, or yeah, if you can sell it. I mean, in in my opinion, it's a great like that concept actually really works because mm-hmm. you are because Carmen. I don't know if you know the story. Yeah, she is in in Spain, and there is this there is this uh, torreador. The the what? How do you how do you say that? Uh, neta, neta how do you say? It? Yeah, but uh, <laughs> I know it in Iceland. Mat- matator, ne. matator. Yeah, matator. the guy who kills the bulls. Yeah. In the matator, the torreador, and the stage director was 
basically saying that Carmen is such a sexual figure and she's always thought of as this ideal, gypsy, mysterious, everybody wants her. Mm. And she is saying, well, isn't she basically the bull? Isn't mm -hmm. she the meat you are selling? Mm -hmm. And in many of the scenes, you're really she is basically a whore in 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 the original opera, mm -hmm. and this I, this this dream woman of some man, and in the staging, she is really staged in a very cold, unsexual way. But all the men are projecting this sexuality onto her, selling her like meat, and which is the logic of her then being the Virgin Mary on an altar, being milked like a cow. So actually, it's very strong, and she is then in the interludes. She is really being stabbed by the by the torreador, like the bull he is hunting, mm -hmm. and which is because she gets then stabbed by her lover in the end of the opera. Mm -hmm. so yeah, in the real, yeah, in the, in the real, real opera. Piece. Yeah, yeah. But how? So I guess like uh, when you do something like this, I mean, that's. Pretty much not just being on stage and singing. No. That's a lot of, you need to, I mean, do you need to be naked in, in your opera? In mean? this one, in this one, I'm in my underwear dancing. And how is that? Is that comfortable or comfortable? It, mm, for, I, don't, I don't really care. You get used I'm to weird. it. Yeah, I, I think if it fits into the context, mm -hmm. I, it's not me doing it. It's my character. Yeah. It's, I have this, I have this thing. So you distance yourself yeah. really from it. Mm -hmm. But only, I can only do that if I feel like it fits into the concept. Uh-huh. And it's supposed to be really uh, an o an over the top scene showing how absurd uh -huh. it is. This this selling of the women in the and the Catholic Church calling certain women whores, certain women saints, saints, and how mm. you are putting how you're offering at the altar, how you're going there to get the blood blood of Christ, the body of Christ, and how it's all co all come together. Mm. So for me, if if the concept works, I you can buy into the storyline yeah. somehow. Yeah. For me, then I don't. Then I don't feel like it's, yeah. Then it's my character. Then it's then I'm a part of a, a whole. Mm. Is and you said so. So you go to Cologne to sing, in Czech. Yeah, and this ah. one, and then this one in French. Yeah, uh, and that's the thing. Like the languages in opera are not English. Is not like a very dominating language in opera. I guess. No, you only have a couple. Of, you only have a couple of operas. So do you speak English. all these? Like, do you speak Italian, French, Spanish? Speak and not speak. I don't know. I feel like I understand Italian, mm. written Italian. Like I can read Italian almost without problems. I have. I'm. I. I don't have so much training in talking. So mm -hmm. I'm very. So the words don't come to me easily. But English, of course, French, I can also because of the Italian and, and I can understand a lot of it, but I don't also don't feel comfortable speaking it. German, I speak fluently. Czech is work in progress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and But uh, is, does it matter when you sing opera? I mean, if you sing if you sing in Italian, yeah. you need to know what you're singing, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. You really, I need to, in order to do it, in order to remember it. I mean, you're singing a long opera, in French or whatever, you really need to understand every single word and and not just understand the word, but know exactly how it's meant and how you're meaning it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the audience sees through it immediately that yeah. you're just making sounds. And that so, must act, hmm? add like an extra layer that you're, <clears throat> I mean, you need to know your role, you need to hit the right tones at the right time, th behind before the... The orchestra, so that the audience actually hears you. Then you look at, need to look at the guy to the right while you're maintaining eye contact with the guy to the left, and you're on your underwear, and then you're singing it in Italian. Exactly. That's a lot of stuff that's going our, on at the same time. That's my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, that's that's basically it. It's yeah. It's so the money is good, I guess. Yeah, it, it depends. Yeah, but as yeah, you can the money can be good. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there? But you you said you mentioned that like this uh, in Germany that if you've been extended for fifteen years, like they extend you year by year, so so they, I guess by doing that they're kind of making sure that you're on your toes, <laughs> you 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 kind of maintain quality. Yeah, there's a lot of competition. It's it's a very brutal world. Yeah, but doesn't also. it offer like some sexual favors and stuff like oh, this, yes. like Me Too and stuff, right? Okay. Big time. Really? Big time, yes. It, but it's less and less now, really. Uh -huh. But there are many stories of, of 
Is this a man's world? Not. It's a man's world, definitely. Uh-huh. Definitely. But it's less and less this this expectation of the of the sexual favors, but it's still you still hear about mm-hmm. way too many cases and And have there I mean, been some scandals, like some you know, like because I don't know, I guess like it's maybe not we we are interested in scandals when it's I don't know Jennifer Aniston or something you know you know what I mean like there is a lot of stuff going on kind of which is off the radar yeah no but like wait Placido Domingo had mm. now he was cancelled aha uh-huh. and yeah he had it was a big deal he lost his position in in the LA opera I think wow I don't know, I don't remember but he had it big time uh-huh. because it was also just known that where, wherever he was singing there was always a pretty soprano that was there next to him, you know? Really? It was a new one. Mm-hmm. Oh. And he was, yeah, and he was going. Yeah. But now, at least from what I heard, it's really, the women have it much better. Mm-hmm. I, and I personally have never even Felt had like anything. a shady, yeah. shady yeah. area, never. Mm-hmm. But I know that my gay friends are really struggling with it. Uh-huh. The gay community still didn't have their Me Too. Uh-huh. That it's really... They're expected to go to the office and go on their knees, and then they'll get the good role. Really? Yeah. Some uh, of them, at least. But that's, least. Uh, and I think I think actually that's. Um, I think we see harassment towards men in a very different way. I mean, obviously, I, I I'll be very transparent. There probably happened many times that I should have complained about something, but I was just so happy that somebody was interested in me <laughs> that I didn't complain. <laughs> and I think I and I honestly think that. That a lot of a lot of uh, guys look at it like that. They just think, oh, okay, and and they're actually maybe more proud of it than sad about it. And I I don't know what it says about us as a species, but but many girls are as well. You yeah. can't forget about that. There's so for every girl that actually pressed charges, how many times do you think they were just happy? With they it. didn't yeah. or weren't yeah. ha- were not happy with it, but they just they thought, okay, care, it's yeah. not. This is not ending my life. I guess yeah. I can forget it, but. Not having to do it is always better. But I think in this industry, it's like, you know, if you take stage arts like opera, um, you know, theater, ballet, it's it, it has an energy. There is a sexual energy that can often be there because you're physically close to someone, you're opening up, you're expressing maybe something. Uh, and maybe in, even in dancing, you know, I don't like ballroom dancing and stuff like this. I mean, like you... You cross all those personal barriers somehow. Yeah, and you're—I mean—you're kissing somebody on stage. You're yeah. having sex scenes on stage. It's there. There needs to be an enormous amount of trust involved. Yeah. And I can mean? easily see people kind of overstepping some boundaries without necessarily a bad intention. Do you know what I mean? Kind of the heat of the moment. Yeah, I mean this this typical thing, especially that uh, male stars have this when they think enough when enough women want me. Mm. No women could say no to me. Yeah, this is the this is the typical trap, isn't it? Yeah, that you have again. Yeah, I never, again. I never, I never. Do you look at me like I no, know this position? No, I'm no, not. but I mean, like, if you've read <laughs> the news in the last yeah. five years, then you know this is this is the recipe of what happens again and again. You have the football players who yeah, yeah. have such a such a enormous amount you lo- of you lose not, yeah. You lose the sense of yeah. any the fact that any girl could say no to you, mm-hmm. and you stop reading nonverbal cues, and that's how you. I thought always when when girls didn't want me, I just thought they were lesbians. <laughs> it was very easy way to <laughs> deal with rejection. Of course, of course. Uh, no, no, a, no disrespect. I mean, yeah. being a lesbian can be great, probably for those who are, but the, the, they missed out on me, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> no, but this, yeah, but it's but it's a difficult thing, and especially in a field that is so subjective, mm. because you really have. To, like, who's to say that you really didn't think this singer was better or worse, or you have ten singers applying for the same, like, ro- that you want to sing the same role? Mm-hmm. How do you decide? Yeah, it's really I'm just like he can say, oh, "I like her hair more," or you know, of course, it should be the voice. But I mean, when you have ten singers who are at the same te- technical level, mm-hmm. of course it, of course it creates the situation that somebody, well, you're as good as her. Why should I? Pick, not pick her and pick you, you know? Mm. That's, yeah. But I think also with this, um, that, you know, love, love wakes up in, in, I mean, you meet your partner often 
I don't know, at work. You can meet your partner at school. You can meet your partner on stage. You can meet... So I, th I think it's, it's really... It, this is one of those gray things, you know, like there are relationships that come out of something that maybe someone would think is a sexual harassment when it's happening, but it's actually flirt. Yeah. And and the, the 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 reason why it doesn't go into the sexual harassment category is that the person who's being flirted with actually likes the other person. If the person who is being flirted with doesn't like the other person, then it's harassment. You know what I mean? It yeah. it's such a fine line. It's all about reading non-verbal cues. Yeah. It's all that's the skill and that's and exactly knowing where to stop. Yeah, no, that's the skill mm -hmm. set that we. I think now the challenge of the society today is to teach little boys mm. to read these cues. Mm. And it's not about you're never allowed to look at a girl. No, it's about the finesse of the situation that mm. you need to really learn to know when you're raping. Mm. Because that's basically what a whole generation or all generations until now, basically, in very many situations, don't know. Mm. And that's that's the that's the thing that, that's the problem right now. That you're really this this accidental raping that you think that oh she's I guess she's not that into it, but still like she's not throwing me off her. Mm. And then actually she says, "Well, I was frozen in fear," and it's yeah. I think I think that's that's the mm. that's the whole thing. Yeah, but it's but not and it's not so complicated, and it's insanely no, complicated for me at the same time. <laughs> for me, it's it's actually really simple. But I also do know that I come from a generation which we we grew up communicating. We grew up being around each other. We didn't grow up communicating through a telephone or through a computer, and so we these reading those cues from your environment was a very much of a part of my upbringing. And I and this, what you said about people losing it when they actually get money and power, I've seen that, I mean, many, many times. And and, uh, and I think that goes both ways. I think it's just, there's more men out there than women that are have gotten them into that kind of position. But uh, I don't know, I think it's, I, th I think the, those who have lost that connection to, and think that wh whoever is out there can be mine or, you know, no one can say no to me. I think they have lost a lot of connections to a lot of other stuff as well. I oh, think it's, yes. it's just like a sociopathic uh, behavior, either created by money or you make money by being a sociopath. I don't know what is the cause and what's the effect. Yeah, of course. Um, it's all the rich people that I know are a little bit weird. Yeah. There's no one normal. Yeah, me too. That's true. Um, That's okay, mm -hmm. so... I don't know where we are here. Yeah, but you went on tour with Björk. Yes. I want to I wanna talk about Björk. Now, two Icelanders on a podcast talking about Björk. Mm -hmm, of course, you got to do it. You toured with her, right? I toured with her, yeah. Because we, she, that church choir I was in, she actually got us to sing on her album Biophilia mm -hmm. to do the background vocals because she was working with a lot of a cappella stuff and crazy sounds and a, in, yeah, interesting soundscape. And, and there, from that, point on she wanted to first record every voice individually and then have like a choir of of speakers around her was her original thought i thought i think but then she decided to take us with her on tour that mm -hmm. she would have this big biophilia show with us dancing around her and and that's what we wound up doing and where did you go well we had like we had the residencies which we would stay where we would stay like for 3 to 5 weeks in one city we started in Manchester and then we went to New York and Argentina and wow. Japan and That's it was great. really it was amazing. And then we would also tour the festivals uh -huh. in the summer then. And then she would have a smaller group. And I actually left the tour to go to Vienna after Artistic the first year. Differences or yeah, creative it was, differences. It was just I, I just couldn't <laughs> no. No, no, I just needed to continue with my own thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it must have been a great experience it was, um, though. It was amazing and just getting to know the the different side of this, yeah. This, but of course, it was a luxury tour because we had because she is such a name that she really could have the tour the way she wanted it. So yeah, we you're had not sleeping often. in the back of a Lata station. Mm -mm. Yeah, it's a mm -hmm. it's luxury. It was really like especially mm. the especially the festivals. We were really at the Hilton Hotel and and with all of the main like headline bands after parties and Great. it was really it was amazing. And we're actually and it was nice because we didn't have our our name on the line, you know, we were kind of just there, yeah. like oh, like a fangirling or <laughs> and being like backstage <laughs> with all of the all of the cool bands and getting these tickets to the festivals, and it was really amazing. Yeah, it was so great. much fun. Yeah, I, I always like it. Uh, like uh, 
it's kind of show, kind of uh, crystallizes how small Iceland is. That uh, when you say I'm from Iceland, ah, do you know Björk? Actually, I do. She lived next door to me she, because me and Björk lived in side by side in 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 Reykjavik for I don't know three years or something. I mean, she was almost never there. She was always touring with people like you yeah. in some big uh, gig somewhere, you know. And I was at home drinking beer, but. Uh, um, but it's so funny that it's so, it, and it's such a typical Icelandic thing. Yeah, yeah, I know her. She, she, you know, we went to school together or something. You know, it's always, we have mm. such short lines of separation. I mean, here you are, and you toured with her, you know? Yeah. But it's, it's yeah, it's nice, but she's just the most amazing artist. Yeah. She is really, it's all her. That's so amazing. Yeah. That she is really the one coming at the sound check, sitting at the back of the room, saying, can we... Like have a bit more bass. We need this. Like it's she. It's amazing. Mm. She has these crazy ideas. I mean, we had a lightning in a cage. Yeah. That was just a thing that was touring with us. Just like yeah, why, why not? Like to have use us to play the ba- like that. There was a lightning playing the bass line uh-huh. in the songs. Like who who does that? Yeah, but that's the cool thing about her. She gets yeah. an idea and she just goes ahead and does yeah, it, yeah. and she doesn't doesn't seem to give a shit about what people think. I mean, and I think Icelandic people, we are extremely proud of her, but at the same time, I think a lot of people who are proud of her, they kind of dislike her because they don't really know how to do with her. You know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. She's such a She's not so unpredictable, in like, yeah. like abroad. I mean, her music is not played as much no. in Iceland. As, no, as it's a very interesting thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so you told me when we were, we were chatting before, like... Um, um, that the one of the thing or the, one of the reasons why we we could meet is that you had to practice and stuff like that. And then I was asking, okay, so what hours are good for you? He said, no hours are good for me right now. <laughs> so that's one of the, you know it's irregular hours, right? Yeah. And you need to protect your voice. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you need to. It's all about being on point for the for the time you're on stage. Mm. And while we're rehearsing in the faces in these six weeks that we are rehearsing, it's alternating between 10 to 6 and then the typical opera actually the typical theater days are 10 to 1 and then 7 to 10 mm-hmm. so you basically don't have a life when you're on those when you're working those hours you really i mean what do you do on your lunch break everybody else is doing something else and you basically need to sleep because you need to sing for another four hour mm-hmm. four hours in the evening and but yeah but but do you you go to the gym then or something or run or yeah i, I when it's like when we're having orchestra rehearsals, I usually try to sleep in between. Mm. When I have the luxury of doing nothing else, when I'm just focusing on this project, I I really love I really love it because I feel like I'm much more on point. Like I can really rehearse. I can use the rehearsals much more mm. when we're having this morning and evening blocks. But at the same time, there's just at least for me no social life, and and I mean going out for a drink with people is just not not an option actually. Because of the voice. Yeah, because of the voice. Like, you need to speak so loudly when you're at bars. Mm-hmm. And the alcohol also dries up your throat. Mm-hmm. And when you're also drinking, you tend to scream a bit more and talk a bit louder uh. and stuff like this. So how how long can this be that you just can't speak? I mean, what's the longest you've, you've gone without speaking or, or, or trying not to speak? Yeah, I was I went three weeks straight without speaking. But that was because I really... It was at, the, at my last year of studies. No, the year before. I didn't yet I wasn't using my body in the correct way so I was putting too much strain on my vocal cords and I wound up getting what you call a vocal nodule that I got like a swelling on it mm. and the only way like you can either operate on it or just not use your vocal cords mm-hmm. so I just didn't for for three weeks I just didn't wasn't allowed to talk so I was that weird person that just had like this book and I would write down everything and I was like for example at a Eurovision party not allowed to talk <laughs> and that so was kind of so funny. So I, I, everybody was talking in a circle, and I was always starting to write what I wanted to say, but then the conversation then I, had yes, finished. Yes, and I was like, oh, like ripping out the pages, like a dramatic teenager trying to write a letter, you know. <laughs> so basically, three weeks. You went three weeks without speaking. Yeah. Not a single word. Not a single word. Well. Or like. Like it, really, just saying like. Can I yes or no. Like or in the yeah. in the in the apotheek. but really, it's funny how you yeah. And did and it? and did did it help? Did it you know? Did you get rid of that? It was a swelling on the yeah. vocal cord. Yeah, it went away completely. And I then I trained, then I trained with my vocal teacher to get back on track. And actually, 
after it, I came back a much better singer than I was before it because I had the chance to like restart some of the muscles and get uh-huh. rid of some bad habits. And But how is it when you don't speak for three weeks? I mean, do you realize then, I'm just curious because I've never been silent for more than three minutes, I think, but do you... Do you then realize that l- most of the stuff you've been talking about is useless or not necessary? I mean, do, do you know what I mean? Is there some is there some revelation that happens when you haven't spoken for three weeks? Yeah, yeah. You definitely realize how much of what you say is really unnecessary. Mm. And wait, I I think that it was already like five, six, five years ago. I thought there was a revelation, but I forgot what it was, which is not very good. And no. it's not a very good revelation, is it? No, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> no game changers. No, no, but but I remember the feeling of oh my god, this is a game changer. But the fact that I don't remember it. So really basically, the life <laughs> of an opera singer is very complicated. Mm-hmm. On stage, mm-hmm. lot of practice, not a lot to speak, no social life, no drinking. Yeah. No, it's not. No. This is this is the. But time I guess you own. socialize a lot with the people in the opera. Yes, and it's fun. The opera people are fun. They yeah. Are really, yes. It's you meet such amazing weird characters, and I just I love weird people. Mm. I just love, yeah. I love interesting people and people who are passionate about what they do. And you have so much of that that you when you do something that takes takes such a discipline and and some. I mean, you really need to dedicate your life to it. Most of most people do. Mm. But I mean, but there are also people who are not going so crazy with with the discipline, and but that's usually audible on the voice also. But in some cases. But is it is it eighty percent work, twenty percent talent, or y- you know what I mean? Like I think I think classical music is is even more work. Mm. I would say really like the natural voice, of course, something. It's but I would think like having a ma- having a material. Five percent, yeah, because it's such a. You need to learn. You need to work so much for it because you need to just literally learn all the notes. You need to. It's a lot of things that you need to mm-hmm. slowly study. But of course, there are people who have it easier through their talent. Mm. But it's a but it's a lot of work. But I really, at least for me, I've now been dramatizing it a bit too much. It's really, and you have the fun moments and you no, do no, go out, no, yeah, I, and you do I, go out yeah. for drinks with colleagues. You just yeah, need to, like it's a day before a performance and you yeah. don't, and then sometimes you have a month where you don't have a performance and and also, I mean, you work many weekends but then all of a sudden you have five free days. Mm-hmm. You're just, yeah, really just doing nothing and minding your own business and having random, having random holidays and like having a random Monday and Tuesday where you really just at home and like, oh, I guess I have to save my voice, so I have to stay at home and watch episodes all day. Yeah. Such a difficult horrible, life. Yeah. It's a horrible life. <laughs> yeah. So to complain about that is is quite ironic. I had friends who, who worked for the Icelandic opera, you know, like uh, behind the scenes, you know, and, and uh, uh, that was a lot of fun there after shows and stuff. Like, you know, they used to leave on like Fridays and Saturdays, there were parties there in the basement and we they would invite us, their friends. And it was fun, you know, and you could see that those people enjoyed each other's company, you know. And it's, I guess this is like any other business or any other job that people have, which is kind of off beat somehow or you know i don't know off hours or strains or different like i don't know stewardesses they hang out together you know because they always work these strange hours super early in the morning or super late in the night so it creates a kind of a togetherness within the group i guess yeah definitely and also just having a hobby that is such a that not so many people not so many other people share it's not Mm. the typical thing so you really can go you can go Get, get into such deep nerdy conversation about it and it's always so much fun yeah. when somebody shares your passion yeah. <laughs> it's always nice um, what's the like what's the biggest fear I mean what's the worst thing that can happen to an opera I mean you, you've lost your voice that mm-hmm. has happened to you is that the worst thing or is it to be on stage and you don't know your lines yeah, I think like having a note crack is always very scary because when you, I mean, you're using, especially when you sing the really high opera sounding mm. notes, it's really very little needs to go wrong so that it goes, uh-huh, uh-huh, that you completely, off. that you really go like, uh-huh. <laughs> and that's scary. If that happens, if your voice cracks or, or, or just if you forget your lyrics, that's also, or forget the melody or just mess up in a big way. 
That's but always the, scary. But the cracking, is it scary because you're worried that next time you need to go high, it's going to happen again? Yeah, but it's also just embarrassing. Yeah, I know, but you you get back you get yeah, back in you get, tune, you know. Yes, yes, definitely. But I because I was watching yesterday a video of of uh, John Bon Jovi, mm-hmm. and uh, he was singing a an old Bon Jovi song, and he was not having a great day singing it. I mean, the guy is obviously I mean he's probably sixty or or, or something, and and uh, and some of that music is probably wasn't easy to sing in the first place, you know, and, and let alone after 40 years of singing it 50,000 times or whatever. And uh, and and what I was surprised was that he just he just kept on going, you know, he just kept on, he knew that he wasn't hitting the tones, he knew that he wasn't in key, you know, he knew that he was off. But he was smiling, he was on the stage with his guitar and he just kept on playing, you know, and I was thinking... You know, I felt really bad, you know. Um But yeah, but of course you have you have that sometimes as well, just in the opera that you hear somebody is just completely we say off your breath when you're not like yeah. when you're not able to get back to your technique, when you cannot find your center again and you really sing the last hour of the opera just awfully. Wow. I've witnessed that, yeah. Do you just hug them then or, or what do you do? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean you cannot you cannot change it and you just say, Okay, this was one performance of yeah. many, I mean, shit happens. It's life. Yeah, it's real. It's it's real. It's not some edited recording that really. Yeah, I've had I've had performances that I felt like wow, this should not have happened mm-hmm. in front. Like not like awful, but really like felt like wow, that was not, that was not at a level I'm I'm happy to share. Mm-hmm. But usually it's like at a fine level, and I mean you are always the one who is dwelling. On the small yeah, yeah. mistakes, which the audience then doesn't notice and doesn't think about. Yeah. You're the one who is thinking, "Oh, that note sounded so awful," but not the other seven thousand like notes that exactly. were great. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but that's I think that's very human to to kind of focus on what went wrong instead of focusing on what or, or remembering what went right. Yeah, definitely. How how I mean, how was it in 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 opera and COVID? Because I guess. I don't know how it is here, but I mean, if I look in Iceland, like my sister works in the National Theatre, and basically the COVID risk group was the people that came to the theatre in general. You know, it was people over 60, 70, mainly. And yeah, so they really had to, you know, shut down and there was nothing going. I mean, is that the same in opera here, you know? Yeah, of course. I mean, just when you think of the... The concept of the thing, you have a choir of 40 people on stage, mm-hmm. then you have an orchestra of 60, mm-hmm. and then you have eight or nine people yelling at each other. Mm-hmm. Like, singing, yeah. singing, singing at each other, <laughs> but yelling at each other with their saliva going three meters in front of them because they're enunciating their consonants, you know? Mm-hmm. That's that's a recipe for, yeah, all the group infections in the world. Yeah. And especially in Germany, because I was living, I was still living in Cologne when it started. I was still mm. living in Germany. And there they had this rule that you really need to have six meters, like you're not to be closer to somebody in the singing direction than six meters. Mm. And that makes most singing very difficult. Mm-hmm. So just yeah, just getting the people on stage is a is a problem. And then we're not even talking about the getting the oh, audience yes. to get uh, there. Because even recording stuff was was they were trying to do some streamings and stuff, but you need to really make it look quite unnatural if you want somebody to do a love scene with six meters in between them. Yeah, that's kind of a yeah. How it was a crazy time actually, and but <coughs> money-wise, were you on the payroll the whole time? Yeah, I was. And, I was and very that's, that's government. That's government. That's tax money, right? Yeah, that's tax money. Tax, and, tax money and sponsors. I was on the basic pay. Mm-hmm. I didn't get the show pay, and I didn't get my freelancing gigs. So mm-hmm. I was like on, on like half or less than half of my usual mm-hmm. usual salary. So it was a big financial. Shock, like it was a and big financial strain even, on us, and you can't work because no. you do not even allowed. You know, yeah, you yeah. couldn't go and sing in a funeral. No, even. no, no. But mm. it was still for us who are on a steady payroll, uncomparable to so many of my freelancing friends. Were really, mm. I don't know, working in coffee houses and or no, they couldn't even work in coffee houses. They were mm. really trying to do everything, just going. Yeah, didn't really stopped singing after it. Many, yeah. many didn't find their way back because. They got out of training because you really they got out of the, out of the physical condition and mm-hmm. found it extremely difficult to get back in. Mm-hmm. Not to mention losing, I mean, everything you worked for your entire life. Mm. 
to lose that just like just just like that. But it's state crazy. state support like this. I mean, for like, why? What do you think? Why why do we need to support these arts, or do we need to support them? And why not some other art? You know, like is there a I don't know. Is it a historical thing that we should kind of maintain, um, or is is it sim is it simply so? If it wasn't supported, no one would get into it because it's such a long it's such a long time of preparation, or you, you know what I mean? Like, is there a? It, this is definitely opera is the most expensive art form mm -hmm. for sure because you need really it's it's what they call in German Gesamtkunstwerk. It's mm -hmm. really all of the. All of the arts put together because mm -hmm. you have the visuals and you have, which means Music, you have a, you have singing. to pay a lot of people oh, to costumes. get one of these bad boys. So yeah, yeah, you have the costumes, you have the, you have designers, you have light designers, you have act, you have, you have a stage director. Like if it's for an acting, you have an entire orchestra, you have a choir, and it's and and it's very, so it's very expensive. So it would not be doable. It can never, mm -hmm. you can never pay for a, an opera with the ticket sales. Mm -hmm. That's just impossible. Mm -hmm. You can never, you can never get to that. That will never add up. So I guess it's, yeah. It's the only I'm way not, to keep not, opera yeah, alive. Yeah, it's the only way to keep it alive. I mean, of course, you can do smaller things and you can do operatic concerts and you can do things with a smaller orchestra, but these big, big things. But I don't know now. After it opened again here, I've been singing in front of a full house almost, almost every night, mm -hmm. and the same in Germany. Mm -hmm. People are coming now back to the opera so much, and people enjoy it. Maybe part part of the reason why this these arts are are <coughs> strong here in this region also is is the political landscape in the old days. You know, like I'm talking Middle Ages and 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 you know, fifteenth, sixteenth, seventeenth, eighteenth century. All of these arts, <coughs> or especially like opera and classical music, were really under the wing of the you know the emperor, the kaiser, the king. You know, like and and if we think about it, I mean. Yeah, you would probably have your guy playing the banjo in the bar somewhere, and but he was a one man show. He played the banjo in the bar, and somebody threw him a coin, and and he was set for a week, you know. Whereas the kings were putting on a grand show, mm -hmm. and they could afford it because it, you know, that's what the king does. He owns money or a queen or you know they 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 could do it. So, so maybe yeah, because we had our very we had strong empires here, like the Austro-Hungarian Empire. I guess they fostered this art form and they financed it as well, you know. Yeah. So it's kind of been put into the DNA for a really long time. Yeah, I think so, definitely. But also, I mean, it's a status symbol, even, even today. I mean, mm. it's the ridiculously rich people who show... I mean, you have it in American movies. All of them are going to the Metropolitan Opera who are... Mm -hmm. They're going there to show that they're rich. They have tickets every week to the opera, you know. Mm -hmm. So that is a lot of that, and it's a lot of what we do is also meeting with sponsors and having private concerts for sponsors and stuff mm. like that. Mm. But I don't know; it's diff it's a difficult question to say why it should be kept alive. I don't know. Mm. I it's to get to give people the chance to enjoy something extraordinary. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, but I we, think it's tradition. I but we keep tradition. a lot of stuff alive that doesn't necessarily make financial sense. You know, that's the whole thing. I mean, we we could we could have that uh, argument or debate about a lot of lot of other things in life in general. You know, so I I mean, I guess you know we we can uh, we we vote the politicians that decide to finance this. So we must in some way agree with it. But yeah. it's, it's and it's done. also and it's also very healthy. I mean, it's been shown that it's it's going to the opera or going to some a classical concert or just that it activates so many stations in your brain because mm. there is so much happening and you need so much. You're, stimu you're stimulating, yeah, you're stimulating the yeah. yeah. Um, but, is there a like a what's it called like a holy grail in this? Like you know, is there like oh when I've been singing. Okay, I don't want to say Carmen now because we talked about her before. Now I need to show off a little bit. A Aita, isn't it? A Aita, Aita. No, what's her name? A I Aita is also a famous opera, yeah. but that's not her. But that's a soprano. That's not my. <sighs> that's not my voice. Okay. No. Is there? A, is there? A, but is there like a grand work where you sing it on the stage in Verona, and then you're then you know you made it? Yes. What, what's definitely. the holy grail for you? For me, because that's a. 
weird thing, but I specialize in singing and in acting that I'm a boy. Uh huh. It's very yeah. I very. saw actually on your Facebook some mm-hmm. pictures, and I was like, wow, that's cool. Yeah, you but that's make, actually like, yeah. yeah because I I'm then because I'm I'm acting te- I'm being a teenager a teenage boy. Mm-hmm. So they wrote that for a female voice because that sounds more like a teenager than if you have some I don't know fifty mm. year old tenor with a belly. <laughs> I guess it's then. <laughs> so for me, it's an opera by Strauss called Rosenkavalier. Mm-hmm. And to sing that in one of the big German houses would be amazing. But which is the, the Rose Night. But mm-hmm. I'm actually, I'm singing the role here next year, mm-hmm. which I'm very excited about. But it's going to be a big challenge. In German in, language? In German language here mm-hmm. at Stadtny Opera. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's going to be, so that's a huge thing. But I don't know this. For me personally, I had such low expectations of myself that I'm really already, I'm already so happy, even if I'm just so happy that I get to do this as my job. Mm. I, but of course, the, the the great thing is to be, to sing at the great houses where you get to work with amazing people. That's for me always the best thing. Mm. That you get to have amazing colleagues around you and just know that what you're presenting to the audience is at a really high level. Is there a lot of Icelandic people like, out in the world singing opera? Uh, surprisingly many mm. for how for how small the nation is, but no, not so many. I think really working singers that are internationally working. Mm. Twelve, maybe. Mm-hmm. So do you think we like bring something to, to does Iceland I don't know, do we as a I don't know, as a character or something, do you bring anything to the table? I don't know, do you have some voice capabilities that come from screaming in Iceland in the <laughs> kindergarten or something that, you know, or the I don't know the 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 seaweeds that we eat in the I don't know they talk about the Nordic voices are warmer somehow uh-huh. they talk about that because the Slavic voices have this metal they have this brutal sound thing uh-huh. but the, but the Nordic voices have more of like a like a warmer color very uh-huh. often that's so is that appreciated or or like uh huh yeah that's appreciated so when you go and negotiate the salaries and you go oh, I'm a Nordic voice here you know they like they know 10%. it when they hear it baby yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so so you're getting you you live here in Prague. Your 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 bo- fiance is mm-hmm. Czech. You met in school in in Vienna. Vienna. Um, been together for seven years. What's the what's the cultural difference like? Oh, but he is very. He is not a typical Czech man. Mm. He was raised. What is a typical Czech man? Typical Czech man is kind of it's kind of a madly man. Mm. I would have to say I think, and that the gender roles are quite clear. Mm. That that you're expected to really the patriarch lives a good life here. <laughs> yes, surprisingly much. But of course, there are exceptions. Just to be politically correct here, mm. but no. But for me, coming here, it was such a like with him. I don't have it so much. He is really he because his mom, his mom on purpose raised him so that he was helping her with with vacuuming. He was like because she had three mm. sons and mm. she thought to herself, they will like I will I will make some woman happy in the future by, mm. which I'm very grateful for. Mm-hmm. But coming here, it's so funny. I'm really because Czech men they they just carry your bags. Like I'm I'm minding my own business with my overly when I I pack way too much when I'm coming from Iceland. So I have my insanely heavy luggage, and it's my in as an Icelandic woman. I think well, my problem, my mm-hmm. too heavy bag. So I have to deal with it, and I have to carry it up the stairs. It's my punishment for packing too much. Mm-hmm. But then some Czech man comes and basically doesn't even ask and just rips it from my hand yeah. and then complains that it's heavy. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like, yeah, I didn't ask you to help me. <laughs> so I found many, I found myself in many a weird situation where I'm basically like playing tug of war with my yeah, luggage. Fighting with for some your female <laughs> independence, <laughs> Icelandic independence. Yeah. And then the Czech man just stand there judging me as I like struggle to carry my bag myself. It's Yeah, yeah and they look at <laughs> you probably and think, oh, she, she. She must have been, she must have divorced or something. Nobody can live with a woman like this. Oh no, never. But how how but what, what does your fiance think about I- Iceland and Icelandic uh, attitude? And I, I had this I had this guy the other day here who said that he's done business in Iceland. He said you never finish anything. You 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 do ninety five percent of the work. You never finish that final five percent. Then you say an Icelandic saying that 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 it will and which means in English. It will take care of itself, but nothing does that. Yeah, no. Hey, Is there I, something like this that your boyfriend looks at and? Yeah, mainly with me personally. I'm mm-hmm. I'm completely like this. I always 
half have half finished projects just everywhere, mm-hmm. and then that sometimes makes drives him crazy really. But he loves Iceland. He really he he wants to move there. He loves everything about it, and and mm-hmm. gets gets along with my family great. It's well, really why do you think that is? What is he? What what is it about Iceland that is attractive to a Czech? I person. think the Czechs just love sports and nature, mm-hmm. and Iceland is, of course, the the wet dream of everybody that loves nature. Mm-hmm. So I think it's it's not it's not a complicated no mix in that. It's really at least every. It's, I'm, I was so surprised here how many people have actually been to Iceland. Mm-hmm. That it's really they're all and you rec- always recognize them because they're always wearing the name brand and the fancy outdoor clothes and yeah. and ready to ready to go camping in yeah, Iceland. Or I, I remember when I started working, there were guys coming to the office and they were dressed in this outdoor gear. And I, it was an IT company, I'll admit it. So it wasn't like a, necessarily a place where you, the dress code was or the dress style was something flashy. But And I remember there was this guy that had been coming for like three, four months and he was wearing those hiking pants and hiking shoes and a hiking jacket. And then... He had this thermos with a coffee or something with him all the time. And I remember I asked the, one of the girls in the reception, said, does he camp outside here somewhere? Or, what, what the <laughs> fuck, you know? But that was just his every... I mean, I have a feeling that they're always ready to go to the mountains. But also, when you when you get into this sport and you spend all your weekends, mm-hmm. you just leave Prague. You always have... I mean, the typical... Like in Iceland, we ask about the weather. Yeah. Here they ask, what are your plans for the weekend? Yeah. And their their answer is never. Oh, I'm just gonna chill at home. No, yeah. no, no. They always have at least two trips planned and yeah. and, and stuff. I, yeah, it's so, actually. Uh, I was talking to a, a girl today that we were talking about the drinking habits. So here it's normal to maybe go out two, three days a week, like I don't know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and have a drink with your friend. But then the weekend you just go out of town, and you might you might drink one or two beers. But it's it's the weekends are not about partying. The no, weekends no. are about this, what you were saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting into nature, biking, hiking, kayaking. Yeah, but it's nice. But I guess it's a logical thing that when you wear this stuff always on the weekend, mm. and then you see it's raining, yeah. why not take your ultra fiber super jacket to work? I mean, yeah. it's just, I, I, when you get into the mentality, yeah, yeah, you, you, at least I feel like I get it, but I, I, I still. Yeah, it's it. like when I was fat, I, I just started wearing sweatpants. And then uh, because I was fat and then I could just wear sweatpants and it was very comfortable and I just wore sweatpants for some years, you know? Mm-hmm. And then I stopped being fat. Well, I don't, I'm, <laughs> yeah, well, I became less fat. Talking about that, it, this it ain't over until the fat lady sings. Now you're not fat. No, I'm not but very do fat. You, would you sing better if you were fat? That's a good question. I've thought about it a lot and I feel like when I lose too much weight mm. I feel like I, I sing worse uh-huh. I feel it I have to really be in a certain like range, certain range yeah uh-huh. but because it's also a matter of stamina and when the stereotypical old timey fat opera ladies mm. they were not expected to move as much as we do mm-hmm. and for example for me it's on really the stage on the stage mm-hmm. I mean we are really actors who are singing mm-hmm. so we need to first of all look the part mm-hmm. which is very Debated of what what is more important, having the having the voice or the looks. or look like mm-hmm. somebody that, like when you're playing somebody like Carmen, for example, then you need to make it kind of believable that all the guys are willing to kill for you. Mm-hmm. But maybe that's a silly thing to say. I mean, all the guys could kill for whatever woman if she's charming enough. I don't wanna I don't wanna generalize here. <laughs> no, no, but, <laughs> but yeah, you, but you know, yeah, what, I know what I mean. mean. This is yeah, stereotypical yeah. that yeah, yeah. Exactly. that you want you that you want to get this movie movie element into it mm. but actually some of the voices some of the parts you just cannot sing it with a small body mm-hmm. it's literally physics that you need a bigger body to create a bigger sound mm-hmm. but that doesn't necessarily ha- have to mean fat mm-hmm. but, okay. and, but and of course but that yeah but of course this needing to relax and it's easy to justify not going to the gym if you have to sing the day after because you cannot be like doing Doing sit-ups, uh, sit-ups yeah. and pull-ups and everything. I need that to get into opera. This is yeah, a great, right? great excuse. No, because you really, if you, if you, if your core muscles, you need your core muscles to be strong, mm-hmm. but they can never be stiff mm-hmm. because you need it to stay like fresh and bouncy, mm-hmm. so that it can all relax and resonate. I'm fresh and bouncy. Fresh. <laughs> get me in there, you know. 
<laughs> no, so it's really uh, a delicate balance that you need to really do cardio because you need to be fit because you need to run up the stairs and then be able to sing a long phrase. So mm. you really need to be in shape to a certain extent. Yeah. But to look like some supermodel is something that, in my opinion, is an unrealistic new mm. requirement that the makes the art actually suffer in mm-hmm. my mm-hmm. that you are choosing rather the skinny girl for the role than the woman who actually can sing it mm-hmm. and there are so many that there are so many examples of that happening right now uh-huh and that's yeah so so uh, b- but do you think like this saying this it ain't over until the fat lady sings is that gonna are we killing that there will be no fat ladies left in that must be then the only industry where we are not embracing being fat but of course it's yeah it is coming like mm. you are of course the the getting rid of fat phobia is being fought against and mm. i don't know but this it ain't over until the fat lady sings i just saw the opera that that actually refers to uh-huh and that it's tristan and tristan and isolde by wagner mm-hmm. and that's a long that's a long one mm-hmm. it's really you think it's over but it's not over yet and then you hope it's over and it's not over yet. And then you pray to everything that is holy that it's over. And it's not over until the main leading lady with her huge voice, which is usually sung by a bigger girl, and then she sings her aria. And you think it's over because she's singing, right? The fat lady is singing. Yeah. But no, no, her aria is like 40 minutes, and then it's over. But it's really, it's it's so... <laughs> but how is it? Wagner is... Hitler liked Wagner. Yes. Do the Germans, can they... Do they embrace Wagner, or or or, or is he off limit? Uh, how how was that? No, they embrace it. Uh-huh. They embrace it. It's a big part of their. It's a big part of their culture, mm-hmm. which is quite. Because, because I just saw this. Yeah. I saw this meme the other day. You know, like, do you drink water? Yeah. Ah, so did Hitler. Kind yeah. of guilty by association, you know. And I, I I was just wondering about this because I was reading about that. Yeah, that he was a big fan of Wagner, and then when you mentioned Wagner, then it just came to my mind. Like, you know, do they actually? So they dare going there because when you yeah. talk Hitler to a German, they kind of get really small. Mm. And they just want to disappear. Yeah, no, but it's I mean it's nationalism. Mm. Wagner is the because most of the traditional operas are from the Greek mythology uh-huh. or from some other religion, and Wagner had his he I mean he did the 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 Ring of the Nibelungs. Uh-huh. Yeah, Nibelungs. Yeah, yeah. Nib- yeah, yes, Ring and of he, the Nibelungs. Yeah. Which is our mythology, which is the Nordic mythology, yeah. which is the national pride of of Germany, uh-huh. which is why Hitler liked it so much because it ah, is ah, there's a connection. Yeah, because uh-huh. he was looking for his his inspiration for the operas came yeah. from the Germanic Nordic mythology. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it's difficult for the Germans then to not fight to get back to it because it's also their it's their history. It's yeah, their, yeah. Be, be, before yeah. this one guy came and ruined the whole thing, you yeah, know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, um, so if it wasn't the opera, I mean, where where would you be now if 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 you hadn't made that decision and and felt good about singing and where would you be? Oh, it's a it's a really difficult one. I think I would be. I was considering becoming like a historian or something because I always enjoyed reading. Mm. I think I I I find it so it's so. Difficult to imagine, but I don't have any like any thought of where I would concretely where I would be. But I think I think I I always wanted to be a teacher. Mm-hmm. That was always my, mm-hmm. but like a school teacher for like I would think like fifth grade or something like really in that range mm-hmm. because I feel like it's such an important job and and yeah. So I think maybe I think I would have ended up somewhere in that direction, mm. but it's difficult to say. And I'm very very. Glad that I wound up going this weird road that I've been on. And no one ever told you it was a stupid road that you're on. No one ever told you you're never gonna make money, get a real job. Oh, just co- only constantly. It's yeah, no, but <laughs> they say yeah, no, always really. When are you gonna get a job? <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, I mean, as long as you're living from it, then you then you're good. No, yeah. but all through our studies, I mean, the studies in Vienna, it's so competitive that they're constantly saying, like through the entire studies, they're saying if you can possibly imagine doing anything else go to that Mm -hmm. because it's so competitive and the odds of you actually living from it are small small. Mm. and even though i'm living from it now i'm very much aware of the fact that when you stop looking young when your voice maybe stops sounding so young Mm. you really 
many singers stop really stop working after 40. After and where 45. do you go there? Then? Yeah, then you then you teach and then you do mm-hmm. other things and then you back to the funerals. That, no, but yeah, in a good way. I mean, it's mm. not a it's a nice thing. And I mean, teaching and 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 doing other things connected to it. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, many be- many singers become stage directors. Or, which is then great because working with a stage director that used to be a singer is the most amazing thing because they actually know they know how difficult it is what they are asking for and they know what's actually possible because when you work with stage directors that are coming from a theater world they don't necessarily have an understanding of why you cannot lie on the bed and put your head put your head down yeah, and, <laughs> and sing yeah. yeah yeah so no there are many other things to do than literally to be the person on the stage mm-hmm. but yeah, but it's a it's a competitive field then. But I guess that applies to most yeah, of the a arts. Lot of, yeah, most most arts, I guess. Mm-hmm. And yeah, but my mom always had this mentality of, you do what you want, and then the future will reveal itself. Because oh, she, that's yeah, great. Because she used to be an actress, and now she's a school teacher, and she is so happy and no regrets, and she in- loved her years of acting. But she, after having kids, got such impossible stage fright that she couldn't enjoy it anymore, and then she couldn't justify it anymore. Wow, mm-hmm. that's interesting. It's very interesting. Those kids, Those they're kids just trouble. They mess yeah. you up. Yeah. No. Um, okay, so you just said earlier you're an expert on social media. So you have like yes. 17 different Instagram accounts yeah. that you're managing. Mm-hmm. Right. No, I'm, I'm working on. I'm working on making a homepage. So maybe by the time this airs, I will have a homepage. Okay. But wait, I cannot ad- advertise it now because I don't have it. But no, uh, but I will put it in. Put the, it I'll in put the, yeah. it in the episode notes and yeah, then. Yeah. Uh, but you have an Instagram, right? I have an Instagram, and I actually have a YouTube channel. Yeah. Also. So that's. Uh, so that's basically my my where where I'm at, and Facebook also. Yeah, mm-hmm. I will put those in the in the, uh, and 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 we actually we were talking about it before we started recording that you might uh, be able to send me at least one recording of you singing. Yes, we will. Like that I will then have. play, probably now at the end of this episode. Yeah. If if you if you don't hear. Atta sing at the end of the episode. Because then she chickened out. Yeah, no. she chickened out of sending me. She wasn't a singer no. after all. She <laughs> no, but then there are just, if you look for my name in either in Cologne or or at the Prague National Theatre, it really, mm. opera is something you should you should experience in life. Yeah. You, see, you should see the whole thing. You should be there in the beautiful hall, mm. seeing the, feeling the sound waves, seeing the other people enjoying it. It's really... A life mm-hmm. kind of situation, and those guys. I mean, there are there are a lot of flights from Iceland to to Prague this summer, yes. and uh, so definitely it's a chance mm-hmm. to come and check out a and show. And all of next year, I'm I'm singing, yeah, a lot next mm-hmm. year here. There's a lot of lot I mean, of interesting I need, stuff. I need to come. I need to come. I need to come and, and see it. I've never I've mm-hmm. never seen opera in my whole life. Really? You have to. Uh, it's really okay. it's something special. No, but it's uh, no, I but I get it. I'll, I'll bring my girlfriend. It's gonna surprise her. I mean, she will hear this. Yeah, but that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you should. It's a it's a special thing. It's it's different. Mm-hmm. If it's well done, it's really. Yeah, I was lucky once. I mm-hmm. I, I, w- I went to see um, uh, Vivaldi four seasons um, when I was like, I don't know, maybe eighteen or something. I had the worst hangover of all time, and my father woke me up and I said, "Listen, I'm not going today because it was a school trip. I'm not going in today." And he said, yeah, "You're going," and I said, "Yeah, but I'm drunk." I will drive you, and he drove me to to the Hauskolabio. That's the Icelandic kind of uh, university theater that is used to stage the uh, Philharmonic and, and symphonic. Mm-hmm, where the, it used yeah. to be the home of the Icelandic yeah. symphony orchestra. Yeah, and uh, and they, uh, it was an eye opener actually to me. And I was an eighteen year old listening to you know I don't know what Metallica, Slayer, Guns N' Roses, and all that stuff. It's it's such great music. Like it's so complicated, it's so well arranged, it's so well composed. A lot of it. Mm-hmm. So actually, I, I I really like it. It's just I don't know. You you kind of always just go back to the stuff that you were listening to when you were a teenager. What do you listen yeah. to every day? No, but the thing is, with classical music, you usually need to have heard it before because yeah. it's so confusing. But it's also like that with other music. When you go to a concert, you're usually not hearing the songs for the first time. No, no. The songs you enjoy the most are the ones that you've had on repeat for uh, a month. That's uh, true. And, and what is on your repeat now? I mean, uh, pop, pop wise or rock wise or something. I, I have a little bit of everything. I'm now doing a lot of like nice music, like Kings of Convenience and stuff mm. like that, mm. and Sylvia Stevens and like this this happy, relaxing music. Mm-hmm. But I'm listening to also. I love 
the singer called Anna Sophie von Otter. She's a great lead. She sings like German German mm-hmm. songs. Mm-hmm. So I'm also listening to to a lot of that. Mm. As well as of course the stuff that I'm learning and preparing for next season. Yeah. But but I feel like just classical music when you're in it, it nothing can move you like like the phrases of of some romantic mm. classical music. It's really for me, it's something out of this world. I find a lot of similarities actually between that and death metal. Yeah. Because the arrangements are usually complicated and and you have these half steps of notes and stuff. It's it's it has less boundaries than let's say traditional rock music or pop music often. It kind of can go anywhere, you know? Yeah, definitely. But I'm just I'm just a sucker for everything that I can see live and I can see people living it, you know? Something that you can see moves people. Like I went with my brother recently, no, not recently, before COVID, to the dr- a drum and bass festival called Let It Roll here mm. in Czech Republic. Mm. And I loved it. It mm. was so like, it's the it's jungle, you know, it's a type of, you know, it, and it's just to feel the bass. When you feel the bass in your body and yeah. you see all of these people crying because it's their favorite band yeah. and everybody's there living their best life outside yeah with this amazing bass and this music that just makes you need to dance because if you don't dance you literally explode because it's so aggressive the bass yeah. in my in my eyes that is also an equally valuable experience as when you go to a concert hall and listen to this elegant mm. Mozart stuff it's for me it's just all music has everything that is made with some sort of love to the art we no matter from what direction Mozart and bass Yes. Drum and bass. Mozart and bass. Mozart and bass. Okay, okay Ada, I yeah. think we're good. Uh, so. Thanks a lot for coming. Thanks for spending time with me. And uh, hopefully now, guys, you're starting to hear the first tunes of <laughs> Ada's music. No <laughs> pressure. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Oh, they're coming over and 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 they're coming over and